Okay, thank you, Dharma. Um, so this presentation is a little bit of a mashup of what I do at ICPSR. It's also a little bit of um, how I came to ICPSR because um, some of that is rooted in my own summer program experience. Um, and it's a little bit about the research that we do at ICPSR to help make data archiving um, a more effective and efficient activity. So a little bit of a research presentation, as much of research as I do at ICPSR, and also a little bit about, about the role. So, um, so thank you to Dharma for that nice introduction. Okay, so this is really my beginning random introductory slide. <laughs> um, I mentioned that uh, my path to ICPSR um, is partly because of my own summer program experience. Um, but even before talking about that, I'm going to go a little bit further back in time to talk about um, how I became um, a sociologist. And, um, and I think that's kind of interesting um, given uh, the commitment that the staff at ICPSR make to the social sciences, the disciplines we come from, it's very varied. Um, so I'll just tell a little bit of, of my story. Um, so I came from a really, really, um, I came from a blue collar background. My parents didn't finish high school and I had no benchmark for what a sociologist would even do when I was um, in high school. But that said, um, I, uh, I, I knew I wanted to go to college because college was a good thing. And um, I'm from Buffalo, and so you can see the insignia there. That's where I went to uh, school as an undergrad to the University of Buffalo. Um, but the way that I afforded going to college was in part because I um, have older parents, and my older parents uh, retired. They retired when I was still in school, before I was 18. Um, and because of that, you receive Social Security dependent benefits. Um, so I got to save for college, even though I might not have had resources to go to college anyway, and, um, and so I got there. Um, the picture of Ronald Reagan is because um, in, during the Reagan era, uh, that Social Security dependent benefit was changed. It was made less generous, in part to keep Social Security solvent. Um, Social Security dependent benefits accrue, are given to children, dependent children of retirees until you're 18. Um, before um, 1981, I think you actually got them all the way through the end of college. So had I had all those resources, I'm sure I would have gone to Harvard and not a state school in New York. Um, but, but here I am. So I went, I went to sociology. So the other thing that I think is interesting, the, what, I, what I have here, this picture of um, the steel factory where I grew up in Buffalo. Um, this was Bethlehem Steel um, in the city of Lackawanna. Um, my dad worked there, as I mentioned. Um, he didn't go to high school, so this was a great job. It afforded him lots of benefits. He was forced to actually retire when he did. It was before he was actually retirement age. And, um, and it was these kinds of experience that shaped my sociological um, curiosity about the world. At the time, again, didn't know what the word sociology meant. I certainly didn't consider myself a future sociologist. Um, but I knew I was interested in uh, the social problems of the time, and so for me, the forced retirement of my dad was one of those, you know, really interesting, interesting topics. Okay. So, um, so I started uh, school. Um, I picked sociology, um, again, not knowing what it was, because I, I knew I wanted to take some classes in aging or gerontology, something aging related. And I went through the course catalog. The very first uh, discipline that I hit upon that had an aging course was sociology of aging. It was my first class in sociology. Um, and so uh, with that, I was kind of off to the races. I loved the topic. Um, I made a connection with my instructor um, of the class. She kind of guided me then both through the, my undergraduate career, but then also into the graduate program in sociology, because again, I didn't even really know what grad school was. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, so I was like, I think I want to be a lawyer, or I might go get my MBA. Um, but she was like, no, 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 what you really want to do is stay in this department and get your PhD in sociology. So I was like, okay, that sounds good too. And I did it. Um, and uh, my own particular interest in aging combined with what my strength was as a student, which was sort of a quantitative approach and um, being good at quantitative methods, um, led me to be sort of unique in my department. The department itself was relatively small. Anyone from University of Buffalo? Just as a per chance. Um, 
And maybe this is an experience that might resonate for some of you. Um, I was in a program that had a lot of people who studied uh, theoretical approaches to sociology. They studied uh, qualitative uh, research, but um, there weren't very many people who had sort of a quantitative bent. Um, and that quantitative bent, of course, introduced me to the world of what um, uh, I did not know at the time would be important to both my graduate uh, career and finishing my PhD, but then eventually my coursework, um, which was uh, ICPSR providing data for the work that we do in our graduate programs. Um, and so um, my advisor at the time, um, I was well matched, you know, also did quantitative demographic approaches to um, social problems and social questions, handed me the catalog at ICPSR and said, pick a data set. You know, so if you're gonna be here as a graduate student, these are the data set options. You pick one and then you study it. And so it was literally a paper catalog at the time. Um, and you can order the tapes and dot, dot, dot. Um, so I loved it. Um, that was ultimately how I did write my dissertation, of course, was a secondary data analysis with data that I got from the University of Michigan, actually the health and retirement study, which um, is not a study of ICPSR, but part of the institute where we are. Um, and, and all of a sudden I felt like there were resources that could support the kind of work that I wanted to do as a sociologist. Um, the other sort of like run in with ICPSR, the weird acronym that came along, um, was the different training programs like you are in here in the four week program, but there were one week programs or one week workshops that I was interested in. I applied, I got in, and I came to ICPSR and what was really life changing was the fact that I wasn't like one graduate student interested in quantitative methods and um, secondary data analysis. I was one of many people who were like me and it was so it was the first time in my sort of um, new career that um, I felt at home because there were other people interested in the, the approach to work that I wanted to do. So anyway, this little bit of background and why the, why the summer program is near and dear to my heart. I still have um, colleagues that I made in the summer program um, that support me at different points through my career. Some of the more senior ones support me in um, really uh, expressive ways. Um, I also have sort of like same peer colleagues that I write with still today and so it's a really the summer program for me was um, a really transformative process, and I hope it is for you as well. Um, so when I was done with my PhD, I was actually starting to get knowledgeable about what the whole thing was about. Um, I landed a good job. It was here at Wayne State University um, as a new assistant professor working in an interdisciplinary research center. And I mention this because it really, again, began to shape how I thought about um, the kinds of work that different science scientists did. So I now knew that sociologists, at least some of them, valued secondary data analysis. Um, but I was the only sociologist in the research center where I was at Wayne State University. Um, and I remember distinctly my colleague saying to me, oh, well, that's really nice that you did a dissertation on the health and retirement study and it's easy to publish papers, but when are you really going to do um, research? <laughs> Um, so anyway, again, shaping this future passion to um, change and revolutionize how we think about the kinds of work that scientists do. Um, so here I am, returning to several years later um, after um, several years in the assistant professor um, tenure track, returning to ICPSR to actually make a difference. And what interested me, of course, in the job at ICPSR was the ability to come here and be part of um, the infrastructure that supports the social sciences. And so I was, you know, publishing papers at a good rate, and I thought I could publish one more paper, or I could do this. I could go to ICPSR and I could publish a data set that hundreds of people might use. Um, and so that was really, really appealing to me. Um, so I was recruited to ICPSR out of, um, I was at the University of Florida at the time, um, to become the director of acquisitions. And really, uh, the director of acquisitions is the um, person at ICPSR. It was actually a new position, but um, the task of that role was to um, sort of survey the field, determine uh, the, the data sets that we might archive at ICPSR and go out and get them. Um, and what it really was akin to was a bit of a sales job. And, um, and because it's all about sort of like, you know, identifying who might want your services, um, and attracting and recruiting them to uh, what you do and um, ultimately bringing the data sets into ISCPSR. It's just remarkably akin to the sales process. We actually use some of the tools in the business world 
to support the pipelines of data that come to ICPSR. Um, so I and eventually my team that worked with me work one on one with researchers like all of you and budding researchers, um, uh, one on one with researchers and project teams convincing them to share their data about how ICPSR will be good caretakers for their data sets. Um, we are interested in data from all social science and behavioral disciplines and data sets that are related to the social sciences. So if you're a climate scientist, your data aren't out of scope for ICPSR because climate impacts humans. We are interested in that too. Um, and so that has been the work that I have done um, over the last decade at ICPSR. In addition to kind of these one-on-one -on -one relationships and our one-on-one -on -one approach to recruiting data, um, another big activity that I've been involved in has been um, sort of, I would say, programmatic acquisition. So defining a new discipline that needs um, uh, awareness about data archiving services and figuring out how to bring data sets from that discipline that might not share data with a place like ICPSR, which is known in some disciplines better than others, and um, figuring out what the challenges will be to that group archiving their data and um, working through those. It also is um, uh, supporting substantive areas and domains and um, methodologies where um, a particular funding agency might want to build um, a base of data to support the research in that substantive area or, again, methodology. So, um, so a lot of the work that I've come to do over time has been, as Dharma mentioned, working on large archiving projects at ICPSR, so writing the proposal and um, leading the, the design and then the execution of that work with, with funding. She mentioned the National Addiction and HIV Data Archive Program that's been going on for over 11 years, I think, at ICPSR. Um, I was talking with the National Institute of Drug Abuse today um, about the project and giving them a status update. Um, it's a project that archives um, uh, longitudinal data sets that have been funded by NIDA data sets that receive a lot of funding over a long period of time. NIDA invests in a lot of long-term studies following people at risk for substance use or users of, of um, illegal substances for long periods of time. Um, and so we work with researchers who in some ways have amassed data sometimes over 20 years, 30 years, um, to determine how best to help them get them, their data into a stable archive like ICPSR so that the data can live longer than the project and also so that um, a, broader, a broader group of uh, users can come to the data. Um, so that's one of the challenges, for example, of, of that particular audience. Um, we also have um, an archive of data on disability. It's funded by um, NICHD and a few other different NIH institutes. You'll probably get the sense. So my background in health and aging and work has led me to be the person who's um, very much working on the health data sets and health projects of ICPSR in addition to acquisitions. Um, so this is a project that currently has funding to support re rehabilitation sciences and um, help build inroads into this group who've never thought about data sharing at all. I talk to people routinely on that project who are like, you want my data and why? It's like with 30 people. And we did a bunch of sensors. I don't know. They so they have a they have um, a range of of studies um, in this particular um, field, and so we're working to help that community um, archive their data. And then my final project is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. At least one of my current projects. Um, I think there's a couple more. Um, and this is a health and medical archive. Um, and this is for our WJ grantees. They have a requirement to archive their data with us at HIMCA, at ICPSR. Um, so this is a great group. They're actually compelled to archive data. Um, and uh, this is relatively new for me. This was a, pro a project that one of my predecessors ran for a number of years. Um, so I'm just beginning to learn the landscape of who these grantees are and ways that we can help them share their data. Um, but I wanted to mention that one too. Okay, so to the research. So the long preamble. Um, so one of the questions that I'm always asking in my role at ICPSR is what data should ICPSR add? Um, obviously we have um, relatively limited staff resources to go out and get data. We certainly have limited staff, staff resources to fix the data sets up and provide the nice ICPSR codebooks that you might have come across if you've downloaded a data set of ICPSR. 
Um, and so as we ask our question, what data should we add, we've attacked that in a variety of different ways through user groups, through setting priorities for, you know, data related to highly cited researchers. Like, over the, the time that I've been here, we've, we've thought a lot of different ways about it. Um, but a few years ago, some of my colleagues and I, Dharma included, um, thought we actually have data at ICPSR itself in our systems that could help us understand what users want. Yes, we could go out and do a user survey, um, and we've done those too, um, but there's other things that we have, traces of data in our systems that tell us about what users come for. Um, so we started to ask the question, what is it, what data do users actually want? And more specifically, what do they want that we don't have a lot of already? So if you've been to ICPSR, you know that we have um, thousands of <coughs> excuse me, data sets and studies in our archive that you can just download and take and use. You know, what are we possibly missing? Um, so we were excited, this said research project to us, and the first thing, of course, we did is where can we get data on this? So we, we looked um, amongst our team for some expertise. This is the group that actually worked on um, assembling the data set and some of the analyses and um, related publications. Um, so Dharma included. Um, and really what we were doing, the data set that we were uh, working on is a Google Analytics data set. It comes from the search boxes of ICPSR's website where over 500,000 searches happen every year um, of people looking for data sets on our website. Um, we scraped all of that information for both 2014 and 2015 from, like I said, the Google Analytics reporting. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> in this data set in 2014, um, got a range of things that happen. So, a lot of people come and they search. They search for something that's really unique. That's 34% of searches, but that's also, you know, misspellings and probably people who found our site that was really, look they were really looking for Amazondata.com. I don't know. So, um, so we get a lot of unique searches, and so that was kind of interesting, and at first we had the idea, maybe we should look at the unique searches, because that'll tell us um, about things we don't have. Um, on the other hand, the most frequent search of 2014 was, I don't know the actual what was searched for, I'm sorry, I, maybe I will in a later slide. Um, but the top search was performed 2,727 times, so that's the range, one to almost 3,000. So instead, um, you know, that first idea was, you know, pretty much a wrong instinct. We're not going to look at the really rare searches of ICPSR, as fun as that might be. Um, but looking even at the top 500 searches, the most frequent searches, we could actually characterize a lot of the activity of what our users are interested in. And even there, we have a lot of places where we don't have data sets, it turns out. Um, so the top 500 searches are around 20% of all searches that happen in a given year. Um, the frequency range of that, that top 500 is 90 to, again, that top number of, of 2,700. Um, in addition to that Google Analytics data set that we scraped that was really easy to create, we had to add stuff to it, of course. So what we added to the data set were the number of results that were returned by that search term. So we went and entered the 500 searches ourselves um, in a couple of different ways, but the bottom line was how many results did the user see when they did that search. And we also did some basic classifications of the search. Was it, was it a keyword search? Were they looking for the name because they knew the name of a person who collected a data set? You know, dot, dot, dot. Um, and so this is the, is it big enough? Oh, God, it looks big enough, good. Um, so these are the um, top 500 searches, uh, well, the top 10, right? Is this 10? 10 searches. Um, so uh, for exact phrase searches, uh, education was the number one search term on the ICPSR website. I knew it was going to be there. Um, and this was with quotes around the phrase, which is just why the number varies a little bit from that 2,700 number. Um, and, these, and so it, these are the things that people look for most frequently, education, crime, health, China, income, domestic violence. A lot of these were things that we would have expected. Um, a lot of them reflect some of the strengths of our collection. Um, and some of them reflect the sort of current topics of the time of 2014 and 20, ultimately also I repli we replicated this for 2015 um, to see how many things are stable in, across year to year and how many things sort of crop up as being a new hot search term. Um, and ultimately what we did um, is looking at the 
the column that's third to the, third to the right, the search study ratio, um, we created a ratio of how many studies were returned relative, um, relative to the search. And so the search to study ratio shows the, lar the largest of that number shows the biggest gap in our collection. So social media um, in 2014 uh, was the gappiest topic in our collection that people cared a lot about. Um, and so dot, 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 NCAA, LGBT, restorative justice, the 2012 election, um, and so on and so forth. Stop and frisk down at the bottom, demoralization. Okay. So anyway, um, as Dharma mentioned, we undertook this so that we could then begin to focus our activities on identifying data sets to fill some of these gaps and holes. We do that. We continue to do that today. We do that in the journals. We do that in grant search databases. Um, and when we're talking to people, we keep uh, a priority list of these kinds of things so that we can use them to help guide and shape our decisions about bringing data sets into ICPSR. Um, but to return to the question of what data should ICPSR add, um, the other question that we thought we could answer with our own data, our next research project, was um, the data that the users are actually going to use. And so um, we wondered, could we look at our current collection and predict, um, uh, according to the title of the talk today, um, what data actually gets used over time? Um, and so we do keep um, data use statistics for our studies. And we began to do that. This is a really old version of the ICPSR website. I'm not sure why I put that in there. Um, but in 2000, ICPSR began disseminating downloadable data to set from the web. And so that's when we actually have then really good records of things like data use statistics. Um, but really in, 20, uh, in 2006, our data delivery improved at ICPSR. Um, so that we could actually build a more systematic data set around those things. So we really started our inquiry looking at ICPSR 2006 onwards. Um, we selected um, a period of three years from 2006 to 2008, looking at studies that were released to the public to use for um, those years, those, that three-year period, um, that then we could follow for seven years. And so that's sort of why we looked at this initial period of years. So we have seven years of data use statistics on our studies um, for 614 studies. <clears throat> and here's the, the trend. Um, so data use in the first year, a lot of the first year itself is not a complete year. So the first co full complete year of a study, if I cut this first year off, would be year two. Um, and so that's sort of the peak of use across all studies that we release at ICPSR. Um, the metric here that you're looking at is the number of unique users that downloaded some of the data sets. Um, so over 45 unique users on average um, in the first full year, which is year two, downloaded an ICPSR data set. <clears throat> it then drops off, of course, a little bit more steeply and, um, and levels off some um, as the seven year progresses. So this is the basic trend. But then we wanted to ask, and we could ask, um, ICPSR has lots of different streams of data coming into ICPSR. We have a lot of different workflows and processes about, uh, around how we prepare data to go back out for release. And we wondered if the data sets we took better care of, if those data sets got more use. Now that's a really simple question. It'd be great if we could actually answer it <clears throat> in and of itself. But the other problem, of course, is the confounding of the fact that we tend to take really good care of and curate the data sets that we expect are going to get the most use. So yeah, there's um, a causality area. So as an association, we just wanted to show, could we demonstrate that some of the different ways that we curate data and take care of and improve data at ICPSR, if it differentiates the use um, ultimately. And so we have categories for replication data. Replication data are data sets that ICPSR does not touch and that was around 7% of the studies across that three-year period. <clears throat> we have, um, and then two categories, membership and sponsored. So what we do for ICPSR membership is a little bit more resource constrained because we have a lot of data sets that get donated and deposited to the ICPSR membership. Sponsors, when we apply to places like NIH for funding to curate data sets, 
um, we have a set amount of studies and we well resource how much those data sets will be curated. So just as a comparison member versus sponsored, you'd expect that sponsored things would be um, curated to a higher level, meaning that they'd be um, cleaner and nicer and easier for people to use. And again, perhaps selected um, for um, high use. Um, and then within that, we make a differentiation between non-intensive and intensive in our database. And so I'm able to further differentiate membership, member data, and sponsored data by those two levels. So we've got five levels in the end. Yay! <laughs> so here's the same curve. Um, oh no, and I, I can't even see the... Um, uh, so the blue line on the bottom is the replication data. <laughs> Um, the replication data are the ones, as I mentioned, get no love and care from ICPSR. People just self-publish them. Most of them are just in support of a journal article. Um, and those get the lowest use at the outset and stay low over the seven-year period. Um, the green line is sponsored projects that are highly intensively curated. Um, <clears throat> and there, of course, it's the, the highest line, as, as we'd expect. Um, the other lines differentiate amongst all those things. So anyway, we, we as hypothesized, um, the data we take more care of and curate to a higher standard get more use. Some of the other things that we could look at um, in our data were some of the things about the study itself, and this is sort of interesting. Um, if it's a more complex and comprehensive study, you would expect that it would be something that would be um, more used and of interest to users like yourselves who are downloading data, narrow range um, single topic studies are going to appeal to a smaller group of users, and so we wanted to test some things like that. So we differentiated the findings by the number of variables, uh, the, the data use trajectories, the number of subject terms, and we broke these into some categories that you'll see on the next um, charts, and whether they were not part of a series, and I'll come to what that means. Um, so here you're looking at the number of variables. Um, so when a study has over 200, 200 or more variables, that's the gold line at the top, it gets the most use. Um, there's not so much differentiation, though, between the next two, either a really small study that's under 100 variables in it or a study that's 100 to 200 variables. Um, and then there's some missing data that plagues um, the data set when you're looking at this kind of variable that we've created. So I guess our hypothesis stands. Similarly, the number of subject terms, so if a study covers more subjects, um, 21 or more subjects, <laughs> um, it gets the highest use and a little bit less for the other two categories. And then finally, um, here, the question I asked about series, which is, um, I guess, interesting because it changes and flips in terms of what's um, important early on versus later. Um, data in series are data sets where uh, there's an, either an annual or a regular update to the series. And perhaps then it's not surprising that when somebody is a user, perhaps, of a series, they're waiting for the latest, most updated data, and, um, and they want that, and they know that it's coming, and they download it when it's new, and then use drops off. So that's the blue line. So if a study is part of a series, it's really hot, and then a little bit not. <laughs> Um, and then if it's just not a study, which I actually find this other part, this 163 studies that were not part of a series, it's just a one-off study. Um, you stays high and really high for the seven-year period, which I think is pretty remarkable. And so over 40 unique users over the course of um, a seven-year period, I think, for a study is um, pretty fast. Okay, so we learned a lot um, in the course of these couple of research papers. One of them is a published paper. One is a paper that we are um, working on and hope to present at a conference later this year. Um, but we learned that we can use our own systems to monitor our users and to inform the way that we think about building our collection. Um, <laughs> the user behavior data at ICPSR leaves these traces in our systems that can help us understand what data sets we should recruit and which data sets we should spend money to curate more. Um, and it answers these questions of what it is perhaps that the users are looking for, um, what data are, is ICPSR lacking, and what data sets are going to get use if we bring them to the archive. Um, the first data set, the Google Analytics data set, is available. You can download it and um, study and crunch the numbers yourselves. 
um, so I put that there. The other, the other data set is a little bit newer and will be out um, when our first publication goes under review, which is at least decent practice. Um, but we have to clean it up, of course, just like anybody uh, before giving it to ourselves. Um, and so uh, the data sets that underlie some of the things that I've talked about, you can go out and find. Um, and then I have just two slides to talk about um, the, because I cannot, you know, I said this was a sales job, like acquisitions is a sales job, and I can't for the life of me talk to 30 people and not ask you for your data, either current or future. So <laughs> I just wanted to stress that ICPSR is, uh, considers itself to be a lifelong partner in sharing data. And even though I focused on sort of what data are most um, desirable, perhaps, to our users or to ICPSR, I don't want it to be um, mistaken or a myth that we wouldn't be interested in your data because it doesn't maybe meet one of those criteria that I focused on today. So sharing data with ICPSR is free. Um, people can deposit data. Um, we're interested in data of any size, and we have a lot of different um, services and ways to handle the data sets, and so people can self-publish their data at ICPSR. Um, so no data set is too small or too um, insignificant. I think all data are good, and I thought that my entire time here. Um, I focused on uh, what ICPSR is pretty heavily known for, which is our quantitative data sets. I didn't exclude other things, but by design, when you're talking about variables and things like that, um, it might not resonate if you collected a qualitative or a mixed method study that you have something that ICPSR could help with. It's true. We, we can help with that, too. Um, we have a qualitative study that arrived just a couple of weeks ago that's working its way through the pipeline. Um, some data sets are public use and downloadable because you can fully de-identify them, but not all of our data are. We also have restricted data. And I don't want to say too much about all these things. I know you'll hear, hear from Lynette. Um, tomorrow if um, you're able to come. Um, a lot of graduate students give us data. It doesn't have to be that it was um, a uh, professor who collected the data. It's uh, possible. We get a lot of NSF dissertation award data sets, for example. Um, online surveys, um, data that led to null results. I just kept going with my brainstorming of like no data are too small. So I'll stop there. Um, and then finally, um, obviously there's really good reasons to do this, to share data sets. Um, many of you throughout your careers will come up against funders who expect you to share your, your data, that want you to have your data in the public domain because they were funded with um, public dollars, with tax dollars to collect the data, and so the public also should have access to the data. Um, it also supports other things that, are, that matter in our careers. When I was putting my... Um, recent promotion packet together, I was super excited to be like, here's my published data set, here's how many times it got used. All those things were possible because of um, ICPSR being a home for data sets, even um, the small ones that I've collected myself. Um, we track data use and related publications for uh, studies that we have, and so it's really gratifying to take a study, look at it, and say, wow, so this was 45 people on average, but it's not, you know, unheard of that I open up a study and it has 400 people that downloaded it in a given year. Um, and not even necessarily those, like, usual suspect data sets like big national surveys, but other things get used really heavily, too. Um, it's also one of the things that ICPSR thinks about is not just giving data to researchers who can put the data into SPSS and analyze it and make publications and do... Um, secondary data analysis and build their careers. Um, but we're also thinking about ways to disseminate data to really broad audiences. Yes, it's free for many people to download many of our data sets. Um, but trying to make those data sets actually really easily useful for um, practitioners, for people in communities, those are the kinds of things that ICPSR is thinking about because we want dissemination to mean more than dissemination for research purposes. Um, Preservation is something that we worry about when you give us data and you no longer have to worry about it. We've done a lot of, I've done studies of scientists where I've asked them, what happened to your data from your NSF award from 1986? And I get, well, it was lost in a flood. <laughs> or my wife threw it out. And, you know, you get this, like, range of things and very rarely do people say, um, it's in an archive, let me show, I can give you the link, you know. So, um, 
At ICPSR, the data sets that first came into the archive 55 years ago are still accessible today because ICPSR uses resources to migrate those things to new formats, to make sure they're documented and useful. Um, and so we like to do that for researchers, and as you develop data sets in your career, hopefully you'll let us do that for you. And then finally, um, one of the other uh, benefits of archiving with ICPSR is around user support and assistance. And um, there's a lot of really low-level questions that um, ICPSR can answer around a study, even if it doesn't know exactly how you collected your data, um, that mean that nobody bugged you. <laughs> and so um, I love to tell people that um, we can handle all that tier one user support kinds of questions. We have a really good staff that do that. That staff, part of that staff um, report to Dharma, and they're really good at um, helping users find data sets, download data sets, get started using them, um, and that just means that your data then actually do get used. So with that, so I've shared a lot of personal things at the beginning, and I had to end with my brand new puppy. On Saturday, we adopted little Olive. She's a Bernie doodle, a Bernie's mountain dog and poodle. Um, and I encourage you, <laughs> if you want to talk Bernie doodles, um, to reach out to me should you have questions about either the research that we're doing at ICPSR or um, I really hope that you have questions for me about uh, data sets that you think we might archive, either your own or others that you know in the field that aren't, aren't at a place like ICPSR. Those are the conversations we'd love to have with you. Thank you. <laughs>